my dad, Pastor Salem, preached the Word of God and encouraged his viewers and listeners to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, honor Him, and have a personal relationship with Him. In today's message, What Must I Not Do to Be Saved?, Dad expresses the only way to heaven is Jesus. I'm Pastor Salem, and I want to welcome you to the Christian Worship Hour. And we've got a sermon today. I bet you've never heard a sermon like this. It's a sermon entitled, What Must I Not Do to Be Saved? What Must I Not Do to Be Saved? But before we do that, let's read some of the letters. And I want to thank you for the letters. We get so many. We read every letter we get. And if they have a problem or question, we try to answer all of them. And uh, so I'm going to give you the address at the close of the sermon today. And uh, then you can write. And we'd just love to hear from you. But here's some of the letters. Here's one from Deer Lodge, Montana. This is a federal prison in Deer Lodge, Montana. I'm a 62-year-old Mexican mafia member who, after 25 years, was converted over to Christianity. I found the Lord, and I get ridiculed because of it. The Lord has showed me his power, even though I'm in prison. Good things have happened to me here. If the Lord can save me, he's got the power to save anyone. Even, in, even though I get a lot of flack, I will not for nothing in this mortal world give up my faith in my Lord. God bless you. Keep up the good program on Sundays. Doesn't that thrill your soul? Here's a man on the way to hell, and he'd have a hot place there with his life. Then he went to Jesus. And Jesus washed it all away. And he says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they were red like crimson, they're going to be like wool, all cleansed. And he says, your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Oh, that's why I love to preach. There's hope. Nobody's hopeless until you're dead. And then it's all settled. Well, let's see. New York City. This is a story. Listen to this. I just wanted to bless you, my family in Christ. Thank you for continuing so faithfully and humbly in furthering the gospel of Jesus with such simplicity. Here in New York City, where I live and work as Broadway performer, it's been difficult finding other young adults aiming at, to life for Jesus, live for Jesus. I'm going to write a letter for some advice. I just wanted to send off the gift to you as soon as possible. And this is a lady. She's in her 20s. And she is a Christian lady. And she's serving Jesus in the middle of New York City. Isn't that beautiful? All of you young people, you in your 20s, your teens in your 20s, you can serve the Lord no matter where you are. And God needs you to shine for him. Shine for Jesus. Let's see. Oh, listen to this. Trinidad, Trinidad, West Indies. Thank you for sending me correspondence every month. I enjoyed John 3.16 very much on the new song. I intend to teach it at Sunday school. Please send me your booklet, Can a Christian Lose Their Salvation? Your Brother in Christ. This is the short wave. I talk to the shortwave people all the time because, listen, now this listener is in Trinidad and he's on shortwave radio and that shortwave radio for his area covers Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and the Caribbean, and the top half of South America. In other words, and then we have about five towers and they cover, we cover... 90% of the world's population. And so when you give and when you pray, you're having a part of it. And here's this dear brother, and he talks about the new song. The new song is a little Bible study we put out every month. And uh, this month it's, it's about the harvest. And so you can get that. Uh, it's free and postpaid. You just write to us. We'll put you on our mailing and the, and the new song then, sometimes he used it in, uh, in retirement homes. Sometimes he used it for Bible studies in Sunday school. That, it's, it's a wonderful little Bible study. And uh, so you write to us. Get your pencil and paper ready. And then if you go to sleep, have your wife wake you up or somebody, maybe a dog will bark or something. 
and then you can write in and get it. And he says he also would like to have the booklet, Can a Christian Lose Their Salvation? And that's a 12, uh, 14 page booklet and it's filled with Bible verses. And it says, can a Christian lose their salvation? And the answer is absolutely not, never. Once saved, always saved. Oh, you say, I don't believe that. Get the book, get the little book. If you can send a gift for us, why, uh, that we'd appreciate it. They help us with the printing and the postage. But if you don't have any money like the people in prison, uh, just write and we'll send it to you. And it's all scriptures, not I didn't have a vision and all that. It's just the word of God. One more letter, Modesto, California. And they write, I love your teaching on the weekend. However, I do wish for a product list. If you would send me one, stay strong in the word. God bless you. And, the, and this is why a real reason I read the letter. And then she says, in 1983, I named my second son Harold. Smartest thing he ever did. He will just love that name. And I'm glad my mother named me Harold because that's what everybody calls me. So it's just wonderful. And then I also want to tell you about a product list. We have a website, christianworshipar.com. You can download sermons. We have devotionals on there. You can read all about our organization, our ministry, and just christianworshipar.com. But let's look at this sermon. I just can't wait to get into this sermon. What must I not do to be saved? And I talked to a man a while back, and in the course of the conversation, I asked him if he was saved. And he was a smart aleck way. And he said in a smart aleck way, saved? What do you mean saved? I'm not drowning, the dumb dodo. Well, I want to start by telling you what I mean by being saved. I mean what St. Paul meant when he wrote to the book in the book of Romans, in Romans 10, verse 1. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So when I'm talking about saved, I'm talking about your soul, about you, about your being, that part of your body that will live forever, and it'll live in heaven or it'll live in hell. That's the most important thing you have. Jesus said you gain the whole world, lose your own soul, you're a, you're, a, you're a loser. He says if you lose your soul, what will you pay to get it back? And there is the whole world couldn't buy it back. Only the blood of Jesus Christ could buy our salvation. See? And so we're talking about where are you going to spend eternity? How are you going to spend eternity in hell where Jesus said there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? I'm not making that up. That's what Jesus said. And are you going to be in heaven where St. Paul says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. And so I'm when I talk about your soul, I'm talking about that eternal soul that will last forever in heaven or in hell. And let me hurriedly say this. You decide where it's going to be. Not your wife, not your husband, not your pastor, not the deacons, not your friends, not your parents. You decide. They can't decide for you. You have to decide. And you say, oh, I won't take either way. I'm neutral. You know what Jesus said? He says that whosoever is not for me is against me. So if you don't choose Jesus, you're choosing, uh, you're choosing hell. That see, Jesus wants your soul and the devil wants your soul. And you decide who gets it. So why do I want, let's look at these things. What must I not, to be, what not do to be saved? First of all, you must not expect to God to do what he expects you to do. There are your, there's a part in salvation for you. For instance, he cannot believe for you. You have to believe. And I, and I had a man tell me one time, he says, I'd like to believe, but I can't. And I, I was just starting out in the ministry. I says, Lord, what do I do with this? Well, I found out in the scripture that God has dealt to every man a measure of faith, and you can believe if you want to, buster. So don't tell me that God did. He tells you you have to be saved by believing, and then he won't give you faith. You have the faith, and you have the choice. 
and said, don't be, don't because of, uh, see, he can't do your part. God can't do it for you. Even God can't do it. God can't lie. And God can't break his word. And he can't believe for you. And then you can't, God can't repent for you. You have to repent for yourself. The Philippian jailer said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And they said, you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he repented of his sins in the scriptures. And he took the disciples and he washed their feet. And he praised God. You have to, do, you have to believe this. And only you can do it. Secondly, you must not wait until you feel like it. Don't wait till you feel like it because that's a very foolish reason because someday why you'll be, feel good and then some days you'll feel bad. I heard about one man. They thought he was going to die. She, the wife called the ambulance, got him to the hospital. Nothing wrong with a little gas attack. That didn't mean a thing. Now the guy says, I feel like a million dollars. He died before tonight. Don't go by your feelings. Don't go and say, well, I, when I feel like it, I'll accept the Lord. Whether you feel like it or not, you call in the name of the Lord and be saved. When you come through your salvation, if you wait until you feel like it, you just may be waiting a way too long. Or maybe just a second too long. And a third thing, you must not expect a more opportune time. You say, well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do I'll accept Jesus. Oh, I want, but I'm going to sow my wild oats first. I'm going to live it up first. And then just before I die, like the thief on the cross, I'm going to accept Jesus. Now, don't you wait to the last minute because I'm going to tell you something. There's only one person in that whole Bible that was saved on his deathbed, and that's a thief on the cross. Just one. And so you better not be waiting because you don't know what your last breath is going to be. You could die young, like the Germans say, the young can go, but the old must go. So you can go anytime. Don't you wait. And I'm going to tell you this. It's like Elijah said. He cried on the Mount, of, uh, on the Mount Moriah, and he, on, on Mount Carmel. And he said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. And the first Kings 18, 21, and Elijah said, choose now, don't wait. Let me tell you one of the devil's tricks. The devil's trick, he will never tell you not to accept Jesus. You say, well, I think I'll accept Jesus. He'll never tell you don't accept Jesus. He will never tell you that. You know what he'll tell you? Wait, wait, wait. See, don't do it now. Do it on your birthday. Do it on your anniversary. Uh, do it at Christmas. That'd be a wonderful present for your wife to see you get saved, or your husband, but, or your wife. But usually it's the man that's coming. In my in ministry, usually it's dad comes last. But don't put it off, because that's what the devil wants you to do. And you put it off, and you put it off, and you put it off until you're in eternity. And, and the Bible says that after death, the judgment, once you die, that's all settled, and we're with God or with the devil. We're in heaven or we're in hell, and there's no changes after you die. So don't put it off. And then don't try another way. For instance, here's a fellow that uh, he thinks, uh, here's a little test. You go out and to ask 10 people if they're going to heaven, and they'll probably all say yes. And then why are you going to heaven? And they'll tell you that something that they did, something they did. They got baptized, they got confirmed, they got circumcised, they gave money, they joined the church, they did this, they didn't kick the dog. They all works. And God says all of our works are as filthy rags in God's sight. He tells us in John 14, 6, and that he is the way to heaven and there all of our works of righteousness will never count for a thing. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And so you have to have Jesus. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus. Because Jesus tells us, he was telling about heaven, and he says, I am the way, John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father. Nobody goes to heaven but by me. Our way to heaven. I love the church. I've been in the church all my life. 
but the church doesn't save us. The way to heaven is a person, Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you have life. And if you don't have Jesus, you have no hope in this world or the world to come. So don't try any other way but come through Jesus, this wonderful Jesus. And another thing I want to tell you don't to, not to do, not to be saved, not to do, is that don't listen to other people. Because they'll tell you, oh, they are, everybody in his dog will have an idea. If you do this, if you do that, if you join my group, if you're in my religion, if you're in my faith, and, and uh, the, I'm not going to get into all the different kinds of churches just so they preach the word of God, that's all. But uh, all uh, people have ways to get you out of the right track and get you on another path. And so you need to listen to God because there's just one way, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the other, others can talk you out of it, but they can't do, have a, do, do a thing with your soul. And I remember out Harry Ironside, when he was a little boy, he became a great pastor, a great preacher, Harry Ironside, and he accepted Jesus. And his mother says, now, Harry, when you go to church, uh, when you go to school, you tell them that you accepted Jesus. And so that night she asked him, Harry, did you tell the boys you accepted Jesus? And he says, no, Mom, I didn't. Well, why didn't you? And Harry says, because they'll laugh at me. And Harry Ironside said, my mother told me something I never forgot. My mother says, Harry, the boys can laugh you into hell, but they can't laugh you out. And don't you pay attention. So what do you do? Well, first of all, we repent. Jesus taught repentance. John the Baptist taught repentance. Jesus had sent out the 12, and he taught them repentance. He sent out the 70, he taught them repentance. But what is repentance? Repentance simply means to change our mind. Sorrow for sin is not necessarily repentance. It might be we, we, as we repent and sorry for our ways, we have sorrow, but we have to turn. Repentance means changing one's mind about sin. It means changing one's mind about God. It means turning from sin to God. It means turning to walk with God. And so that's what the, the Thessalonians did. Paul said, ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You don't turn from your idols. You turn to God from your idols. It's positive, not negative. Come to Jesus and walk with him. And, and, and I, I know you, you'll think, well, I'm not perfect, and I don't know how to be perfect. You'll never be perfect. But just turn, turn from your sins. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then uh, confess him before men. You must be born again. You have to come to Jesus. Nobody can do it for you. And it doesn't matter who you are, what you are. It doesn't matter how much of a sinner you have been. Jesus will accept you, and he'll make you clean. Ma uh, um, uh, Max uh, Lakato uh, tells a story, and it's a true story, and it's written in his book, No Wonder They Call Him the Savior. And this is what he writes. He relates a touching story about a mother named Maria and her daughter, Christina, and they lived in a poor village in Brazil. Maria's husband died when Christina was an infant. Maria got a job, though, as a maid in order to support herself and Christina. There were no luxuries, but they got by. For 15 years, things went well, but now Christina became a teenager, and teenagers often have minds of their own. Christina was not interested in marrying young men and raising a family like most of the other girls she knew and grew up with. Not that she couldn't have had picked of a husband. She, had a, she was a beautiful girl. Her olive skin and brown eyes, as well as her infectious personality, kept the steadiest stream of prospects at her door, but she kept them at arm's length. Christina wanted to go to the big city. She dreamed of trading her dusty neighborhood for exciting avenues and city of life. And just the thought horrified her mother, Maria. 
People don't know you there, the mother said. And she said, when there was desperation in her voice. They don't know you. They won't know you. Jobs are scarce. Life is cruel. And besides, if you went there, what would you do for a living? And that's what was horrified Maria the most because Maria knew exactly what Christina would have to do to make a living. And that's why her heart broke when she woke one morning and f- to find her, her daughter's cot empty. Christina had gone, and Maria knew just exactly where. So the mother went out immediately to bring her daughter back. Maria threw some clothes in a bag, gathered all her money, ran out of the house, and not before, but not before she had an inspired idea. On her way to the bus stop, she paused at a drugstore. She entered a photograph booth there and spent all the money she could afford on pictures of herself. With a pure purse full of small black and white photos, she boarded the bus and went back and went to Rio de Janeiro. And there Maria began her search. Knowing what a girl would have to do to support herself in this cruel city, Maria began with the bars and the hotels and the nightclubs, any place with a reputation for street walkers or prostitutes. She went to them all, and at each place she left her picture. She taped it on a bathroom pier. She tacked it to a hotel, hotel bulletin board. She fastened it to a, for, a corner phone booth, and on the back of the phone photo, she wrote a note. But it wasn't very long, and she ran out of money, and she ran out of pictures, and she had to go back home. She wept on the bus as she began her long journey back to her small village. A few weeks later, young Christina descended a flight of hotel stairs. Her young face was tired. Her brown eyes no longer danced with youth, but they spoke of pain and fear. Her laughter was broken and her dream had become a nightmare. A thousand times over she had longed to trade those countless beds for her secure little cot at home. Yet the little village was in too many ways too far away. How could she ever go back? As she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eye noticed a familiar face. She looked again and there on the lobby mirror was a small mirror picture of her mother. Christina's eyes burned and her throat tightened as she walked across the room and removed the small photo. And on the back was the compelling invitation. Whatever you have done, wherever you have become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And Maria did. She did. And so can you. And so can I. This is the message of the gospel. You may be weary and you may be confused and you, and, and you may be tired, but God will never turn you away. You come to Jesus, perhaps from now, right now in your imagination. Every time you see a cross, you see a snapshot of God. And on the back of every cross, we read these words. Whatever you have done, wherever you have become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. Friend, listen to me. That's the gospel. That's why we're preaching. That's why we have the Christian worship hour. That's why we're working and working to slay for almost 40 years. Come home. God wants you to come home. And you can come and you say, I want to come. How do I do it? You just say, dear Jesus, in your own words, dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. And I ask you to come into my heart and take away my sins and make me pure and white and let me start over again. Just Jesus, come into my heart, take away my sins. And then tell Jesus you'll make him your Lord. You'll follow him the best you can. Now you'll never be perfect. And when you sin, you just ask God to forgive you. And if we confess our sins, he'll forgive us our sins. So you say, dear Jesus, just come into my heart and take away my sins, and I'll follow you and serve you the best I can. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you made that prayer, you write to us. Write to us at the Christian Worship Hour. Christian Worship Hour, all you on the short way, be sure to get this. Want to hear from you too. 
Christian Worship Hour, Box 2002-2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota. Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402 USA. You write to us, we'll send you literature. And maybe you want to send something to help us because our only source of income is God's people. We are not written by any church or denomination or organization. It's just God's people. So you pray and ask God what he wants you to do. And if he wants you to do something, he'll tell you. And then you write to us. Here it is, shortwave people. Box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, USA. And if you send a gift, we'll, be, we'll, we'll put you on our mailing list. And you'll get a Bible study called The New Song, a little Bible study. And you'll just love it. So I hope that you'll write. We're going to be looking for you, each one. Now we're going to pray for you. And in every, every week we pray for our, our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church. And we're praying for the people in Sudan. So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you first of all for the multitudes that are asking Jesus into their heart. They're coming back home. They've drifted away off. And they never th thought they'd ever chance, stand a chance with you. But your arms are wide open and you want them to come. And you'll hug them and you'll cleanse them and help them to come. To the children, bless them as they watch us. To the young people, encourage them. To those who are shut-ins and those who are on sick beds, and those who can't get around, oh my God, help them and watch over them. I know you will. Encourage their heart. And to those in Sudan, lost their lives, some of them. Dad lost their life. Maybe it's a mother. Children are all scattered and nobody knows where anybody is. And they're afraid and they're sick and they're scared and they're hungry. Oh God, just come quickly and put an end to this mess. And then we'll give you the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, don't forget to write to us. To Christian Worship Hour, Box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402, USA. We're audited by the ICFA, and so you don't need to worry about the money being spent. And you write to us, and above, above all things, pray for us. And pray that we'll honor Jesus. Pray that multitudes more will come. Maybe Jesus will come this week. I don't know. But if he doesn't, we'll be back. We'll be at our post and we'll be looking for you. So God bless you. We, God loves you and we love you. And we'll see you next week, Lord willing. My dad loved to preach because he got to tell people of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. If you would like to learn more about having a relationship with Jesus and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, click the encouragement link on our website at cwh.org. You may also stream more programs, subscribe to our monthly newsletter, and view Pastor Salem's devotions and answers. We would be most grateful if you would pray for this ministry and help us financially to continue proclaiming the gospel. God bless you.